It is Wednesday, August 21st, 2019. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. It was a very fun get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Wednesday. Uh, I did actually kick just a teeny tiny bit of ass. Uh, not, not like a lot of ass, but enough ass that I felt really good about my performance. Yeah, we were doing um, we were doing takedowns, and um, I'm all right with my takedowns, but I, I could get better. Um, I can always be better at stuff. I, I'm I'm not of the illusion that I'm that I'm already there, you know. Um, but today I, I had a little bit of a little bit of that sweet and sour action, you know, where there was one one guy that I was rolling with that it was really really sweet. Didn't have any problem with him. And then there was some sour where I was rolling with a guy that was a, um, a belt above me. And uh, he he didn't really put it on me all that hard. I think he was more feeling me out than anything. Um, he wasn't really being, being really aggressive. And I felt like I did keep him pretty much on the defensive the whole time. There, there was like one or two opportunities where he'd actually gotten to a dominant position. But... Like I said, I felt more like he was he was feeling out my my energy and and seeing what kind of things that I was transitioning to. Um, but this guy is really really hard to read because he's fucking awesome. Um, he he's just coming back from an injury, so I know I know that some of the tentativeness is is just due to that, you know, a little bit of ring rust and whatnot. But for the most part. Like I said, it was one of those things where I, I felt kind of like he was fucking with me, but I think I sur- I surprised him once or twice with the way that I responded to uh, certain pressures. Um, and I I did line up a uh, an arm bar, but I made the mistake of not grabbing the pant leg, and it's very very critical, especially you know when you're when you're really fighting for that arm because he he was not giving me the arm, and and so I was just taking it easy and trying to be really methodical about keeping the other arm away and I managed to secure the other arm away from from being able to protect the one arm I had but before I could pull the one arm I had back he managed to roll over in, in like a, um, a hitchhiker escape kind of business and so foiled foiled again <clears throat> next time definitely next time uh, but yeah he, he um, for this this guy in particular, like when when he says things like "good job," I feel like I really did something good. <laughs> and and so today he told he told me not once but twice that was really good. <laughs> so you know I, I think I might have surprised him here and there. Um, and one of the things that I I didn't I I did this time that I didn't do last time was. That like if I if I felt like something didn't really have any future in it, I didn't stay with it. You know, I I let it go really quickly, um, and I I wasn't I was just trying to return the energy level that he was giving me, but at the same time I managed to stay. Like I said, I managed to stay in a dominant position, um, pretty much the whole time. There was there was one or two times that he he got the better of me. Um, but yeah, like I, like I said again, I, I think he was just trying to feel me out for the most part because he didn't really react until like I was in a kind of a threatening position, you know, where I'm like going for a choke or something. And there was one where I did not have the grip right to to actually be able to put enough pressure on him to to uh, get a collar choke. And I, I finally sunk it in, but I, I mean, I didn't actually get it. You know, because he was able to scrunch his his chin far enough down and raise his shoulders up enough to where the, I wasn't able to get the right pressure on his on his throat. But again, that's a next time kind of thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, all, all together, um, it was a good kind of coming back, kind of yeah, kind of kind of coming back kind of thing. Because for for both of us actually, because I I had a couple days off of uh, jiu jitsu. I, actually, I didn't have a couple days off. I I worked out Monday morning instead of Monday evening, and I did not work out on Tuesday. So 
it kind of felt like two days off. Like either one of those evenings I could have gone in. And if my vehicle were in better shape, I probably would have done that. Um, but nonetheless, I, I did uh, I did enjoy the rest. Um, I didn't actually rest all that much, but uh, I just wasn't in jujitsu. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. <clears throat> and as usual, I'm going to play some body count. Because uh, that, that, that's just what we do. Um, I do have... I do have an album that I hardly ever play, and, and I'm looking at it now wondering, maybe, yeah, why not? Necessary Evil, First Dance, by Body Count, here on Coin Metal. And that was Suicidal Tendencies. Sorry about that. I had a little air bubble in the back of my throat there. That was Suicidal Tendencies with Send Me Your Money. Love that song. I don't know if you guys remember that. I, um, I suppose uh, most of my audience is probably too young. Um, but there was a time when there was this televangelist, um, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. And man, oh man, did they talk a lot of Americans out of a lot of motherfucking money. But then they got busted. Uh, I guess um, I guess Jim Baker was a bit of a whoremonger and uh, became a really public thing as his uh, prostitute of, of like preference came out and it, it was just bad. It was all bad. Anyway, got a whole bunch of tabs open in the old browser today and uh, the first one I just caught this one on Twitter um, and, and I'm just going to throw it down because I just found it uh, this is on uh, bitcoin.com um, wait a minute hold on it's actually on ambcrypto.com never allow tether continues to deny bitcoin price manipulation despite data suggesting otherwise and this is by Prussian Ja. Uh, so yes, penis. Uh, this is authored 11 hours ago on August 21st, 2019. So here we go. Tether plays a very crucial role in providing liquidity to the crypto market. And despite several other stable coins being available, it is currently the king with over 90% market dominance in the stable coin market. However... Tether has been marred in, contra marred in controversies recently, be it their claims about USDT supply being 100% backed by the US dollar or the accusations of Tether manipulating Bitcoin prices. Tether has always denied all allegations levied against it, but that does not close the case, as it was proven recently that not all of its supply is backed by, US, by the US dollar. Similarly, a recent API release which tracks the inflow and outflow of USDT on various exchanges showed some very interesting patterns. The price correlation of BTC with USDT. Token analysis thread on their new API launched or, or on their new API launch also highlighted some interesting correlations and in graphs suggesting that Tether's USDT played a major role in pumping Bitcoin price, something which Tether has always denied. <clears throat> we took a look at the graph of USDT volume and compare it with Bitcoin's price. It is quite clear that Bitcoin prices have always spiked whenever Tether has decided to mint new USDT tokens, with the price falling whenever Tether has burnt a certain amount of tokens circulating in the market. Many market analysts have said that due to the level of dominance that, that Tether has on the market, it is quite easy for it to manipulate the prices, sign most of the crypto tokens are paired against them. Or since most of the crypto tokens are paired against them. Tether started to migrate from the Omni blockchain to the Ethereum blockchain, and by July, almost 40% of all USDT had already migrated to the Ethereum blockchain. However, another interesting thing to note here is that despite deciding to move away from the Omni blockchain, 
there has been a significant spike in the number of on-chain Omni-based USDT transactions in 2019. Hmm. Even though USDT is moving to the new ERC-20 based Ethereum platform, the inflow outflow of Omni USDT on exchanges like Binance has been quite similar before and after the migration from Tether Omni to Tether ERC-20. Uh, that, that would mean to me that they're just replicating the same funds on, on uh, Ethereum's network, meaning they don't actually have any more liquidity, they just, they're using the same volume of, of Bitcoin or whatever the, that they use as the basis for their um, their supposed valuation of their USDT and they're counting it on the Ethereum. Anyway, continuing on. <coughs> uh, they've got a couple of tweets here. Even though USDT is moving to the new ERC-20 based platform, the infl- okay, got that. Token analyst, analyst wrote... Tether plays a huge role in providing liquidity to the market as a whole and tracking how much of it is being minted slash burned across blockchains blockchains is key. Visualizing the relationship between Bitcoin price and Tether supply shows interesting patterns around periods of minting slash burning. Zooming in on Binance, we see that the outflow of USDT is of similar magnitude before and after the migration from Tether Tether Omni to Tether ERC-20. We provide exchange flows of stable coins with hourly and daily on, yeah, whatever, got that. Users can also view the complete history of funds moved from one to the other. Okay, oh gosh, that's lame. That was about all there was to all this big buildup. You know, I mean, I, I... I understand what they're saying here. <sighs> they're suggesting that the the price volume, I mean, the volume of of tether on the market is being used to manipulate Bitcoin. I, I've I've said this a lot, but see, what you have to also pay attention to is the amount of t- the the amount of transaction volume on the Bitcoin network. There have been organic upticks in those. Where there's certain periods of time, some some place in the world, somebody has to move some fucking Bitcoin around, and the number of people spikes, you know. And so anyway, um, um, it's been my contention that the the USDT is issued in response to increased organic interest and or organic traffic. See, they make it more expensive to transact Bitcoin by pumping up the price. And that, that also cuts back on the transaction volume. But anyway, um, I, I think what they do is <laughs> they, bring the, they bring the tether on, onto the exchanges so they can sell the price of Bitcoin back down. And, and just so they can walk away with the U.S. dollars. And I, I've explained the process a few times where... What will happen is they've got one or two exchanges that are complicit with them, if not more. And they don't actually have any backing for the USDT that they're bringing onto the exchange. And so they they can sell them for whatever price they want. You know, so they they buy the Bitcoin with their USDT, which were free, right? Then they take the Bitcoin to another exchange and they sell the Bitcoin on that exchange at a loss. But they don't do it on the USDT Bitcoin pairing. They do it on the USD Bitcoin pairing. So they're bringing in USDTs, tethers, buying Bitcoin with it and then selling the Bitcoin for US dollars. And see, th- this is, in my mind, this is how they're getting the money back out of the, uh, it's the whole fucking scam. Basically, they're naked short selling Bitcoin with counterfeit money. That's it. Long and short of it. And the big key is the fact that they don't actually have the collateral to back the fucking tether that they're selling for Bitcoin. You know, I mean, if there, this is one of the things that makes me really suspicious about the 
the New York Attorney General and the central bankers and their relationship with Tether. See, I believe Tether is kind of like their their ISIS. You know, like the, ISIS was the Pentagon slash U.S. Depart, U.S. State Department slash uh, a dozen other intelligence agencies slash NATO. They're proxy forces. They're not official forces, and so you can do all kinds of interesting things that you can't with official forces, even hired official forces. So anyway, <clears throat> I, I think that Tether is like the Federal Reserve's ISIS. You know, they kind of look like us, but they're not us. And they're, in the, and they're, they're specifically against us, <laughs> you know. But they're, you know, I, I think that the reason why there's, there's, n there's no real effort to go after them for fucking counterfeiting. And I mean, it, it's easy enough. The best they've ever pr given was an attestation from somebody who, from what I understand, wasn't the most credible person in the world to, to be doing that sort of thing for them. So, given the amount of liquidity that we're talking about that they're supposedly wing wing and around, you would think that somebody would say, you know what? Five or six billion dollars is a lot of fucking money. It's enough to take down a market. <laughs> so we should we, we should probably get really serious about investigating these people because they're making this claim that it, they've got a that they're a quote unquote stable coin. That they somehow are paired to the U.S. dollar, and, and I believe they're they're also getting into being Chinese yen too. And, and this is another situation where they're they're probably going to be counting that six billion dollars that they count as the collateral for their existing USDTs. They're also going to be counting the, that same volume of money that supposedly exists and is supposedly theirs to control. And they're going to be issuing issuing yen tether, <laughs> and but they're going to be issuing them with with that fun, with those same funds as the collateral, and probably do it with a like you know they'll have some subsidiary that they're counting the assets for for tether as part of the assets of this of this other company. <clears throat> And then it'll be completely structured to where the the books aren't overlapping, you know, they, so that they could be legally defined as two different entities. Yeah, oh, man, fun stuff, fun, fun stuff. Anywho, I wanted to get a little bit further into some freedom stuff. We talked about tether, and if, if I can, I'm going to find that one for. Uh, yen tether or whatever i i may or may not still have that tab open i'm going to take a look for it during the next music break but not right now right now i got this article on reason.com this is by nick gillespie uh so yes penis how bitcoin is freeing people in china venezuela iran and america since launching a decade ago, the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency Bitcoin has been, been lauded and denounced for its potential to route around traditional state-based monetary systems and allow individuals to trade directly with one another. Uh, that's it, not its potential, its promise, its reality of that. Continuing on, much of the discussion has understandably focused on how it is transforming economic exchange. But Alex Gladstein, the, street, the chief strategy officer for American Rights Foundation, a nonprofit that promotes and protects civil right, civil liberties in closed societies, oh, where, where the fuck did I put that? In closed societies, is interested in how it empowers people in autocratic countries to escape government control. Only about 8% of the global transactions use cash, and the switch to digital payments means that authorities can track what individuals are up to with greater ease than they used to. Bitcoin, its underlying blockchain technology, and the emerging Lightning Payment Network. Bullshit! 
Bull, fuck you, lying sacks of shit. Are allowing people to escape surveillance, says Gladstein. Yeah, Gladstein, you're full of shit. Who has co-authored a brand new book on the subject, The Little Bitcoin Book, Why Bitcoin Matters for Your Freedom, Finances, and Future. In today's Reason podcast, he tells Nick Gillespie how Bitcoin is changing the way people live and transact in places such as China, India, Iran, and Venezuela. He explains how an increasingly cashless America cryptocurrency is helping us to escape what's been called surveillance capitalism. Hence why Human Rights Foundation's annual Oslo Freedom Forum is more important than the World Economic Forum in Davos, and how Bitcoin and associated technologies will, quote, really bankrupt the ability of authoritarian regimes to do what they do and basically force their hand to reform. Uh, yeah, dude, th this guy's full of shit. Lightning Network isn't doing anything good for us. In the longer term, it is meant specifically to take us out of processing transactions. That's it. That's all, that's all Lightning Network is meant to do. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm not even going to wait until I get into it. There's another one of another article I've got in here. And it deals specifically with lightning. And if I can find it, I'm going to read the damn thing right now. No. No. That's not it. Oh, here it is. This is on uh, Trust Nodes. And it was authored August 20th, 2019 at 6.16 p.m. No indication of who wrote it, so we don't know what their genitalia is. Anyway. Guy makes $20 a month from locking $5 million in Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. Some person or group that goes by the name of Ellen Big and runs close to half of the entire Lightning Network has stated that he makes less than a dollar a day for the privilege of locking millions of dollars worth of Bitcoins. Quote, I have two to 300 transactions through all nodes a day. Rarely 600. On commissions, I earn 5,000 to 10,000 Satoshis per day. So it's 40 cents to 80 cents. It's $20 a month maximum, he says. He is incurring losses for the services he provides, not just in locking liquidity, but in having to pay far higher on chain fees. Than what, the, than what he charges for LN transactions slash liquidity, so stating, quote, opening of the channels, closing, opening again, I spend probably more than $1,000, therefore no earnings now. The Samaritan runs 1,800 channels between his nodes, and each channel having a capacity of 0.16 Bitcoin, translating to... 336.3888 or 8899 yeah whatever bitcoin as of 18th of august that's about 40 percent of the entire network capacity of of circa 800 bitcoin falling over the past few months as he gets rid of inactive channels there were some 1,080 Bitcoin on Lightning, on Lightning Network as of April. Now it's about 830 Bitcoin, with the decrease mainly, if not solely, due to LNBIG. LNBIG is, closed, unused, is closing unused public channels and reallocating funds to private mobile channels. This will lead to uh, 1ML.com and other other Ellen explorers to report in drop of liquidity, supporters say. Ellen Big himself says he faces a dilemma. Quote, when you open a lot of channels, everyone scolds you that you are capturing the network. When you close, there are also concerns. This person or entity apparently has channels open with all LN users, so extending liquidity to allow them to actually be able to use LN. If you're not aware, as Adam Back of Blockstream says, LN can be seen as sort of tabs. 
your card for some reason suddenly doesn't work at your local shop, so you tell the, the shopkeeper you'll pay him the 100 satoshis tomorrow. The shopkeeper writes this down. Trust nodes owes 100 sats. Now he goes to the supplier and says, this paper entitles you to 100 sats. The supplier then does the same with the farmer. This 100 sats is already locked in the system, but for it to move, we need, quote, free 100 sats, an amount that is not owed to anyone. Thus, this, quote, free sats sort of, it's, sort of is the paper. Okay. Ellen Big is in the business of, quote, creating this paper to facilitate the revolvement of, quote, tabs so that you can make the IOU payment to the shopkeeper. In other words, it is 100% reserve banking. To make that full on reserve work, you, you need for simplicity, let's say 200% collaterals. So one Bitcoin is, quote, free and acts as the, quote, paper for the one locked Bitcoin, which can't, which can't move until eventual on-chain settlement. This collateralization requirement is the main non-political criticism of LNs, with Emin Gensur of Cornell stating last year that Lightning Network is, quote, economically broken. Suppose somebody could receive up to $10,000 from, from Coinbase, and Coinbase says, has, I don't know, 10 million users, so 10 million times 10,000 earn, earn 10 billion or $100 billion gets tied up. Is that right? He said. The other problems appears to be t that the fees one charges for an L LN transaction seem to be far off from covering the cost of on-chain fees. That's perhaps because LNBIG is undercharging in this case. At 300 transactions a day, at a cost of 10 10 cent per transaction, you can get about $900 a month, so just about covering his on-chain fees. However, on-chain fees during this period were not far off from 10 cents themselves, perhaps even less. So even in a pure comparison, it might be the case that Lightning Network transactions have to be as expensive as on-chain transactions. Then you add the cost of securing these nodes and channels, of running the system, the opportunity costs in regard to potential price movements, or simple other investments, or or, or simple other investments and use cases, and you really suddenly have to wonder whether LN transactions are actually cheaper or instead more expensive than simple Bitcoin transactions. For now, the network is very small with just $8 million worth of Bitcoin in total capacity. But as it grows, conceptually, you'd, you'd think the costs would grow too. Certainly the opportunity costs, but that might actually be secondary to pure costs in as far as the more users the, and the more channels, the more on-chain transactions, thus the higher fees. To the point where, for it to be profitable, LN transactions might have to cost as much as on-chain tra on transactions or more. The political criticism in this case is obviously centralization. This one guy can crash LN and make it un unusable. For now, that might not matter because pretty much no one uses the Lightning Network. But, if it is being used and it suddenly goes down because one guy with much of the liquidity closes channels, then this could be reflected on price. You can say that you can say they'd have no interest in doing so, but mischievousness can be less of a concern than potential hacking of the point of failure. Yet, quite interestingly, all of the aspects appear to be more of a distant concern because here there seems to be a pretty fundamental question of whether LN transactions can actually be cheaper than on-chain transactions on, on an apples-to-apples -apples comparison to the constraint of collaterals. Thus, even if one ignores opportunity costs and so on, 
it appears to be a bit unclear as of as of now whether the settlement math does actually work out when we account for collateralization as it stands it seems it doesn't whether that will change remains to be seen hmm no, it does <coughs> that's um that's pretty significant and is pretty significant you know um uh, it, that's a shit ton of money to be tying up you know for the the potential that that somebody could actually hack your lightning node and fuck you up <laughs> that's just a little thing though and, and you know this isn't something that's that's alien to us you know every, it seems like every i don't know 6 months i would say probably probably every six months or so we we find out that the vast majority of the liquidity on the on the lightning network is tied up by one or two private individuals that they you know they're providing that liquidity out there and then when they decide that you know what this isn't profitable for me i'm not going to do it it fucks up the entire lightning network because they've got connections to to you know half the rest of the fucking network and all of a sudden those connections aren't available anymore and the whole network needs to restructure itself <sighs> you know I, I don't think that in the long I, I think in the longer term they're going to find that this does not work and the lofty goals of of onboarding everybody and all it's, it's a bunch of jerking off you know, you're trying to turn Bitcoin into the SWIFT network with this thing. And it, it, in terms of incentives, it also disincentives, incentivizes miners because the Lightning Network handles, you know, potentially millions and billions of transactions, whereas the the light, I mean, the Bitcoin network itself, the on-chain network. Is only enjoying about three to four thousand on-chain transactions every ten minutes, and that's not that's not going to be enough transaction fees to keep them interested. Yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music, and where'd it go? I'm not entirely sure. I think maybe some Voivod. I, I, I'm feeling feeling that's pretty much the way to go the end of dormancy here on coin metal and that was skindred with nobody yeah and so got some more stuff for you here on my my browser and uh <laughs> this next one um kind of makes me laugh because of who's saying it and what he's saying and my own impressions of it so far anyway this is on I believe it's yeah coindesk.com this is by William Foxley so yes penis August 21st 21st 2019 at 4 UTC I'm assuming that's AM Vitalik Buterin increasing transaction costs risk limiting Ethereum adoption Increased cost of transacting on on the on the Ethereum blockchain is hurting the software's adoption, says project creator Vitalik Buterin. Speaking to the to Toronto Star this week, Buterin suggested projects that are considering whether to build on the technology will likely be butted out as the blockchain is overloaded with transactions, or in his words, almost full. While a blockchain cannot ever be technically quote full, Buterin's comments indicate his comment his current sentiment on the severity of the problem. Still, Buterin's comments <coughs> comments speak to his understanding of the difficulties ahead for the project, with major planned upgrades including <laughs> Ethereum 2.0 and the switch to proof of stake consensus ahead. He told the newspaper, quote, If you're a bigger organization, the calculus is that if we join, it will not only be more full, 
but we will be competing with everyone for transaction space. It's already expensive and it will be even five times more expensive because of us. There's a pressure keeping people from joining, but improvements in scalability can do a lot in, in improving that. Ethereum's seven-day transaction fee average, a measure of demand on the network, actually sits at a 50-day low, falling since July 1st to sit around 11 cents per... I'm sorry, 0.11 Ether per transaction currently. So I I don't know why it says that, because why, why would you have Ether and the dollar sign in the same... I don't get it. Anyway, continuing on... <clears throat> Buterin, following past arguments and his current work, presented POS as a potential solution to the problem, stating that altering transaction verification could lower fees by a factor of 100 per transaction, freeing space for organizations to build on the blockchain. More broadly, the comments show how public adoption of Ethereum is a growing concern. Earlier this month, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance appointed the Ethereum Foundation's A. Miyaguchi instead of, oh, I'm sorry, head of its mainnet initiative, a working group to connect enterprises with Ethereum services. Discussing governance and adoption, Buterin said price volatility and cybersecurity remain leading issues as well. He concluded that the government has a role in regulating the space. No, it doesn't. Quote, Governments do have a role, and one of those roles is, re is in regulation. The usual concerns are about cryptocurrency exchanges, where the basic idea is to do fundraising for a new project by directly selling tokens on, on the blockchains. There are debates whether specific kinds of ICOs, um, initial coin offerings are legally categorized as secure, securities. Buterin pointed toward low-risk uses of blockchain such as identification of certifications as adop adoption leading technology. Yeah, whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, the problem that Vitalik still faces is that he is not the network. He is a developer. He has whatever hashing power he's actually dedicating to the network. And that's it. That's what he's got control over. The rest of the fucking network is owned by you and other people like you. The rest of the network is you and people like you. And, and of course, there are some people with hash farms and all that other business but the fact of the matter is is that's that's one of the most compelling things about cryptocurrencies is that they're ad hoc that you can join them at any time and support one of the networks and there are thousands of them out there for you to support and there there are hundreds of projects on a few of them you know and and ethereum is one of them you know where they've they're a base layer for several other several other projects um, but anyway the the point being that Vitalik has been trying to change Ethereum to proof of stake for about two years now and he has failed every time to do so and it is because the miners do not want to mine a proof of stake coin they want to mine Ethereum as a proof of work coin you know number one because it would be a hardware change over for them to go from proof of work to proof of stake but number two because that's the the market model that they signed up for that is the type of coin that they signed up to support you know and and really if they get to I if if Vitalik and the ethereum foundation and all those people get get all toxic about trying to push the miners into proof of stake they're going to end up losing those miners entirely you know and and maybe they're hoping that the the infrastructure demand for ethereum as a proof of stake coin would be low enough that they would be able to handle the the loss of their their fucking network but i i don't think reality will suss that out 
you know, I think too much is riding on Ethereum as a network right now to even can, even bother trying to do such a a I won't even call it an upgrade, a, a changeover, a bait and switch. I mean, <laughs> really, the the miners who are mining Ethereum right now signed up for a proof of work coin. That's what they wanted to support, and so again, I I think that that again if they push it too hard. Ethereum Classic's going to end up getting all their fucking hash power. And then Vitalik's going to be sitting around going, well, shit, what do I have to offer anybody now? I've got a, a useless proof-of-stake coin that is like a number of other proof-of-stake coins out there, and I've just devalued every single other project that is balanced on top of my project. Because, you know, one-tenth of the, the miners that were mining it as a proof-of-work coin are mining as a, it as a proof-of-stake coin. So, I think that one of the things that the developers, I think, really need to start looking at is how do they encourage more people to mine? You know, very many, a lot of these guys have been looking at how do we narrow down the control base of the of the currency, i.e. the network, i.e. the miners, i.e. you, back out of the system? So it's just ours and we can dictate over the top and say, hey, do this, and the whole fucking network just does what we want them to do. How, how, how do we achieve that? I mean, we're seeing it in Bitcoin and... and from a lot of the rhetoric that I'm seeing coming out of Vitalik, I'm, I'm assuming that some of the same thinking is going on between his ears or at least those of his close advisors or other stakeholders in Ethereum. Um, but again, I, I think that this is the kind of thing that drives people to other projects. People don't want coins that they're just talked down to on. And the more you're talked down to on a coin, the more you want to look around for a coin that doesn't fucking talk down to you. I mean, really, you want to lose all your support to Doge? Because Doge don't give a fuck. The Shibes love everybody. And they will gladly gladly accept all of the hashing power from the Ethereum network. (laughs) See, I I think that, um, that Vitalik's priorities for Ethereum... You know, while being well-meaning and whatnot, I don't, I don't think they're the right solution. You know, I think that maybe there's an issue with the block sizes that they have. Maybe the blocks are too small. Who's to say? Anyway, <clears throat> moving on. I got this, uh, this article, and it, it. There's always been this discussion about Bitcoin and other other cryptocurrencies being permissionless. And this meaning that governments and corporations couldn't stop you from transacting. Nobody could stop you from transacting. And so the, there have been several attempts on several fronts by officials to rectify this issue. And so I got this article here. It's on Coindesk.com. U.S. Treasury blacklists Bitcoin, Litecoin addresses of Chinese, quote, Drug Kingpins. This is by Nicola H. D. It was authored August 21st, 2019 at 1753 UTC. So yes, penis. The U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, has sanctioned three Chinese nationals and their cryptocurrency addresses, alleging they violated money laundering and drug smuggling laws. OFAC named um, Xiaobing, Xiaobing Yan, uh, Fujing Zheng, and Guanghua Zheng as narcotics traffickers under the Foreign Narcotics Kingpin Designation Act, freezing any property they own within the U.S., and listing a number of email ad- aliases citizen numbers, and passport information for the three. It was not immediately clear what specifically the three were accused of. 
The agency also listed a number of Bitcoin addresses, as well as one Litecoin address that the agency claims belong to the Chinese citizens. Wednesday's action marks the second time OFAC has sanctioned digital currency addresses specifically, having last done so in November 2018 when a pair of Iranian nationals were added to the specially designated na- nationals list. At the time, Treasure- Treasury Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Sigal Mendelkur, said the agency was, quote, publishing digital currency addresses to identify illicit actors operating in the digital currency space. In addition to naming the three individuals, OFAC listed Quinjang Pharmaceutical Technology Co. LTD and Zeng Drug Trafficking Organization in Wednesday's updates. Individuals who violate the Kingpin Act may face civil penalties of a $1.1 million fine per violation, in addition to possible criminal penalties of $5 million, a $5 million fine and up to 30, mil, 30, or 30 years in prison. <laughs> According to the SDN list, the following addresses have been affiliated with the individuals, and I'm not going to read all of them. And so, yeah. Um. Oh, and that's the other one we're gonna follow up next. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's really fucking hilarious. Basically, they're they're sanctioning individual wallet addresses now. Um, I think what's going to end up happening is they're going to create addresses that are not directly associated with their names in any way, shape, or form. They're going to find a Tumblr service or an individual who has a wallet that's the same way, that's not identified in any way, shape, or form. They're going to send the funds to them. They're going to launder the funds from them to an, that address that I'm talking about that, that doesn't have any association with them at all. And the trail will cease to be. And the investigation will go poof in the night. And as there are individuals and companies that are willing to look at those addresses and say, we're not going to take any funds from these addresses, there's going to be plenty that say, okay, tell you what, man, for 10% of the coin, I'll move it for you from, from your address to my address to another address of your choosing. You don't even have to tell me whose address it is. Just give me the fucking address and I'll send the money to it. But I'm going to take 10% of it. If the if the individual on the other side of it says yes, we are ready to do commerce. That person gets their millions of dollars in Litecoin or whatever unfrozen. I get a little bit of cut of the money. And the DOJ or whoever it is that sanction the uh, OFAC, whoever it is that sanctioned that money, they, they're kicking a, a block of sand right now. You know, I mean, come on now. There's no, you don't have the, the power to stop the funds from moving. All you can really do is tell people, hey, don't do that or we'll, we'll bust your ass. And so it's left to them whether or not they actually want to test your resolve. And uh, I, I believe for a high enough premium, they will. <laughs> it's, it's all a matter of incentives now, kids. You know, it's it's if it's worth a, a thousand bucks to you, you know, in whatever cryptocurrency this person wants to move, pfft, I say do it. <laughs> but that's, that's just me. I... I would probably do it, but that's just me. This is not legal advice. I don't want to. Don't don't come bitching to me if they break down your door and, and don't say Frank Dashwood said you should do it. You 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 put the, that's on you. <laughs> you know, just like your choice of which cryptocurrency to do anything in, that's you. What you do with it, that's you too. And that's one of the big dangers of cryptocurrencies. 
is the inability to avoid accountability. You know, if you knowingly facilitate a, a terrorist and that terrorist achieves their fucking goal and the, the trail leads back to you, good luck, pal. You chose it. And again, this is this is one of the big dangers with you being involved in mining is that you see the transactions happening on the network. So if NATO or some other entity out there decides to go through the back channels of cryptocurrencies and fund their quote-unquote terrorist cell somewhere, i.e. mercenaries, through your network, <laughs> you know... That's that's again on them, and and with regard to that, it, I think trying to hold a cryptocurrency accountable for that kind of transfer, it it would be a bit like trying to hold a firearms manufacturer responsible, or yeah, hold them responsible for if you decided to go out and and nail somebody with one of their guns. You know, they they manufactured it, so they they're criminal, they're facilitating criminal activity i.e. murder I, I keep saying i.e. what the fuck I'm gonna have to cut that one out but yeah the um, sanctioning of individual addresses waste of com- complete waste of time and again it's just a matter of incentives if it's enough money to make it worth somebody's while to move it for the individuals being sanctioned the, the funds are going to move you're going to lose complete paper trail of them that'll be that'll be that but oh, accountability. I, as I was going with that, you know, politicians, people that are in power right now, in powerful positions right now, they've conducted cryptocurrency exchanges, peer to peer transfers, so on and so forth. And if they've done it the right way, their their transactions read from unknown wallet to unknown wallet. But they're human. They make stupid mistakes too. <clears throat> and if in the course of an, a criminal investigation one of their wallet addresses happens to come up there's there's some explaining to do or at least there will be some <laughs> you know that that's i i think that's one of the reasons why we've seen governments be so lax and and tentative with regard to Establishing any kind of regulatory frameworks that they're actually willing to implement. You know, you never see them talking about individual wallets and whatnot, and that's because they themselves are involved. They themselves have funds tied up in wallets. They want to be able to move around without anybody looking over their shoulder, without anybody considering them a criminal. You know, but for right now, all it requires of us is that we be slightly more sophisticated users than the average person, that we put a little bit of time and a little bit of attention into exactly how we set things up, and and we can be just as free as they are. It's that, it's that same, same biblical issue over and over and over again, where Adam and Eve are in the the Garden of Eden and they're they're getting ready to eat from the, the tree of knowledge and the, the tree of life and the fear is they'll become like we are. Well that already happened. That happened back in two thousand nine when the Bitcoin network went live. Since then it's it's been a debate as to who exactly gets to control things? Is it governments? Is it developers? I say it's miners. Because they're the ones that actually put up the hardware and the bandwidth and the electricity and devote it to whatever cryptocurrency project they want. They are the ones that determine the monetary policies that they are willing to support. They are the ones that determine which coins they want to support. And I think that that in and of itself will always be more powerful than some nation-backed cryptocurrency or something like that. I mean, we, we keep hearing talks about things like Libra or <clears throat> or uh, Petro, the, uh, Venezuela's Petro, and, and they don't really ever get any real traction because none of them come to you and say, "Hey, 
If you willingly dedicate some electricity to this, we will reward you in this coin. This coin can be sold for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies on exchanges. It's always, this is how we're doing things. This is how we're going to set it up. It, there's very, very little discussion about you, except for as some fucking nameless, faceless end user. I mean, your your name will be associated with it, and your face will be associated with it. But that's only so they can monetize your selling, your your buying and selling, and your and your fucking your uh, consumptive habits. <laughs> Not 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 worth as much if you're just a number in their stats. You know, gotta ha- gotta have actual identity, so it's it means something. We can compare it to known known psychological profiles of this person or whatever. But those also create liabilities for you as a consumer. You know, when you when you're looking at which currencies you want to use, you're like, okay, well, I can have everything tracked by the IRS. If I use U.S. coin, or I can have everything tracked by Facebook if I use Libra and other banks and shit. I can have all my transactions tracked if I use Visa, or I can use Doge. And the only thing anybody knows is that a transaction happened, not necessarily that it's my transaction, nor what the transaction was actually for. Hmm... Which one is safest for me? Dogecoin. If you are, you know, ethically and technologically get your ass kicked by by Dogecoin, you're going to, in real life, get your ass kicked by Dogecoin. You know, when it's more complex and more expensive for you to do things with Lightning Network and rewards you less than simply mining Dogecoin with whatever hardware that you were going to dedicate to Lightning Network, what are you going to fucking do? I know what I would do. I would mine Dogecoin. (laughs) Because it works more or less the way that Bitcoin is supposed to. Whereas Lightning Network works more like Visa does. And if I wanted to use something that works like Visa does, I'd use Visa. (laughs) <laughs> plain and simple you know and, and I, I think that's probably the thought of, of most people out there that I'm not really alone in that anyway let's go ahead and throw back down into some music and uh, I've been looking for a spot to stick in some, some Probot so here it is Centuries of Sin by Probot here on Coin Metal. And that was sixth with Vivid. And as we're kind of coming down towards the end of it, I got a couple other articles here that I wanted to cover. Uh, let's see here. Where the hell did I stash it here? Yeah, this is uh, this is one that I wanted to get to tonight. Um, it's on Coindesk.com. Tether to issue stablecoin backed by Yuan. <coughs> In Belgian Bank Insider. This is by Wolfie Zhao or Zhao. Uh, this is authored on August 21st, 2019 at 1705 UTC. Tether is planning to. Oh, I'm sorry. Wolfie. Yes. Penis. Tether is planning to issue a stablecoin pegged to the Chinese renminbi, according to a trader with ties to the company. Zhao Dong, an over-the-counter OTC trader in China and shareholder of crypto exchange Bitfinex, which shares managers and owners with Tether, revealed the move on WeChat on Wednesday, saying Tether plans to call the stablecoin CNHT. His peer-to-peer crypto lending business, uh, RenRenBit, will support trading and deposits for CNHT when it is launched, he said. He added in a later post, quote, Personally, I think the offshore yuan stablecoin could boost the circulation of offshore renminbi and internationalize it. 
Regulators may be happy to see it proceed and succeed. I doubt it. You're going to be counterfeiting Mermimbi too. <laughs> Tether is best known for issuing the US dollar pegged USDT and did not respond to requests for comment. Zhao told Coindesk that he believes the new stablecoin will be quote, launched very soon, possibly within weeks. He said that stablecoins reserve is expected to be held in a bank in Belgium. Why not China? <clears throat> In his view, the token would have two main benefits. It would make Tether less dependent on the US dollar for its stablecoin business while boosting the circulation of Remimbi held offshore. Zhao said he did not know if Tether has buyers lined up for the new stablecoin. It is unclear which blockchain the CNHT would be built on top of. Tether's USDT has been issued on top of the Bitcoin blockchain as well as the Ethereum and Tron networks. Offshoring RMB The Chinese Yuan has traditionally been just a domestic currency, but that changed in 2003 when the People's Bank of China signed agreements allowing banks in Hong Kong to provide offshore renminbi deposit, remittance, exchange, and other services according to the South China Monitoring Post, or Morning Post, my apologies there. The offshore trading market for renminbi took off. Hong Kong is now one of the largest hubs for offshore renminbi, holding as much as 6.04 billion, oh I'm sorry, that's not a point, that's 604 billion yuan, approximately 85 billion dollars, in customer deposits as of June 2019, according to data from the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. However, China still imposes a cap on individual citizens' annual foreign exchange volume at $50,000 or an equivalent amount in other foreign currencies. The news of Tether's plan for CNHT comes while Bitfinex and Tether are under investigation by the New York Ator Attorney General for an alleged cover-up. According to the NYAG's office, Bitfinex borrowed funds from Tether's U.S. dollar reserves to fill a shortfall in funds after losing access, access to $850 million of its own funds held by a third-party payment processor. On Monday, the New York Supreme Court denied Bitfinex's and Tether's claim that the NYAG lacks jurisdiction to cover the investigation, saying the companies must cooperate with the agency. Bitfinex and Tether have appealed the decision. <clears throat> yeah, and so, there you have it. I, I've long contended that Tether is Again, they're just meant to circulate real U.S. dollars back out of the crypto market. You put the U.S. dollars in, they take them out. I feel that uh, this this stable yuan, it'll probably be the same thing. Now, what, what will be really interesting is if we start seeing a leveling of the volatility between U.S. dollars and Remimbi on the world market as a result of this because they, they have to have stability right well if they're having stability that means that they're also sharing the dynamic that the Remimbi and the US dollar are experiencing out on the live market well that could mean that the inverse could be true as well that they could be using cryptocurrency exchanges and doing US dollar to US or I'm sorry, USDT trades between their their uh, US dollar backed tether and their Chinese renminbi backed tether, and in doing so, they would be the ones enjoying the uh, the differential and arbitrage. And uh, yeah, I I think that they would be doing the same thing that they're doing to cryptocurrencies now. Where and I mean you can find it on any chart, and I don't care which coin that you pull up, you will see that before the existence of Tether, there was way more, way more depth in the market swings. Okay, and then Tether shows up, 
and it goes down to itty bitty blips. And see, I, I personally, I believe that there there is significant market manipulation going on there, and that the the tether don't there's they're free to ifinex, and so any any loss that they may experience in selling them cheap for for Bitcoin that doesn't hurt them. You know, they they can buy Bitcoin as expensive as it gets because if they want to, they'll just print off another two billion tether. And, and you don't have anything to say about it. And again, they, they can afford to sell the Bitcoin for cheap because it didn't cost them anything in literal money or at least a very, very little amount in, in real money, <clears throat> whether denominated in Bitcoin or, or in fact U.S. dollars. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is it was relatively free to them, and they're they're able to pay off whatever short term loan you know when they when they repatriate the U.S. dollars into their accounts. <laughs> you know, they, say say they got extended a little bit of credit by Bitfinex when, when they bring the U.S. dollars back in, all is forgiven. They walk away with some profit. And they can start the, the whole cycle all over again. Anyway. Uh, let's see here. And then I, I wanted to cover this one because this is pretty timely. And it's it's one of the reasons why, why Bitcoin even exists. Is that you're supposed to be able to hold your own funds in your own wallet. And, and not a wallet service provided to you by somebody else. I mean in a QT wallet. Or on your own live note, live note, or full node rather, at home. Anyway, I got this thing. It's on Nasdaq.com. Dan marks uh, GISC Bank to charge wealthy clients for deposits, and this is authored on August twentieth, two thousand nineteen, at six thirty-seven a.m. EDT by Reuters. <clears throat> And, and you know what? Let's follow that up really quick. Because usually they... No, it's just a reference to Reuters. Never mind. Copenhagen, August 20th, Reuters. Uh, Denmark's Gisk Bank will begin charging wealthy individuals for deposits instead of paying instead of paying interest, it said on Tuesday. Less than two weeks after launching the world's first negative interest rate mortgage. Just Jaisk Bank, Denmark's second largest lender, said it would introduce a negative interest rate of 0.6% for clients depositing more than 7.5 million Danish crowns, 1.1 million dollars. Quote, market expectations indicate that the negative negative interest rate environment will last for several years, Dan added, or damn, damn, hmm. The Nordic country was among the first to introduce negative rates in 2012. Uh, yeah, in 2012. Wow. <clears throat> Earlier this month, Jaisk became the first to offer a negative rate on a home loan. In effect, paying customers 0.5% to borrow money for 10 years. Such moves reflect prospects of a global recession prompting central banks to try to kickstart the economy by measures such as cutting lending rates. Denmark's late, largest lender, Danske Bank, has said it has no plans to introduce negative interest rates on deposits, though, though Switzerland's UBS has said it would impose a negative rate of 0.76% on wealthy clients who deposited more than 2 million Swiss francs or $2 million, with its Swiss bank. Denmark last month became the first developed economy in this year's global plunge in bond yields to have negative yields on all its government bonds. Ah, that doesn't bode well. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's one of those things. If you put the money in your own wallet, your own cryptocurrency wallet, they can't take it. There, there is no negative interest rate on that shit. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, 
it's a big advantage. But I got this one last one. I think we can cover this, yeah. And uh, this is a this is another thing is that it, cryptocurrencies, by and large, are permissionless meaning no one can stop you from using them how you want to use them, with whom you want to use them, so on and so forth. Anyway, I got this thing. It's on uh, Cointelegraph.com. This is authored by William Suberg. Uh, so, yes, penis. And it was authored approximately 18 hours ago. India. Supreme Court gives Central Bank two weeks to justify crypto ban. Judge. RBI has not properly responded to representation. In the latest session of an ongoing hearing into the actions of the Reserve Bank of India, RBI, on August 21st, the court ruled that officials had not appropriately responded to concerns from the cryptocurrency industry over its actions. The RBI forbade banks from servicing crypto operators such as exchanges until July 2018, effectively stopping such platforms from continuing to operate in India. On Wednesday, the move came in for severe criticism from the Supreme Court Justice Rohitan Farhi Naraman, as summarized by advisory source Crypto Kanoon, which was present at the hearing, Nariman gave the RBI just two weeks to justify its actions. Quote, Now Justice Nariman questions RBI why you have not properly responded to the representation. You just said that we, we are forwarding to government. Angrily, this, angrily says this is not an answer. One update on Twitter read. RBI agrees with two-week deadline. Discussing the final outcome of the hearing, which is now over, Crypto Canoon summarized, quote, Case takes the most un- unredactable turn. Wow. That's a weird word, dude. Justice Nerman directs that RBI must respond to representation in the, appro- in the manner appropriate, offers to defer the case for two weeks as part of the, part of, part, as part. Let the let the answer come on reconsideration of banking ban by RBI. RBI has agreed. <clears throat> the case comes at the same time as the Indian government considers making cryptocurrency illegal for all Indians. In July, a government committee recommended Delhi moves to ban all tokens except an official digital version of the rupee. Subsequently, as Cointelegraph reported, an expert estimated the country would lose a market worth of around $13 billion if the ban signed into law. Yeah, um, you know, I think in the longer term they're not going to do any kind of ban, any, any at all. You know, the Indians, uh, you know, people of India are not stupid. Not only do they love to speculate and and uh, gamble, which you know is, is some of cryptocurrency, um, they like business. And when you're telling them, "Hey, we're going to cut you off from this thing that could potentially make you millions of dollars and expose you to international markets," <laughs> what do you think they're going to say to you? I think they're going to tell you to fuck yourself. But that's that's just me. Um, yeah, I, I think that. Their, gov- their government officials, again, are involved in cryptocurrency, have been involved in cryptocurrency for a year or two, maybe more. And so the, this urgency here, you know, give me, you've got two weeks to figure the, figure it the fuck out, RBI. Um, I, I don't think they're telling them you've got two weeks because, you know, they, they're expecting some governmental change or whatever to make, make cryptocurrencies illegal. I think they're they're like, dude, I need to know why you're fucking me up here. Because my son has a cryptocurrency business and he is losing money the longer you people fiddle fuck around. So get off the pot, you know, you know, figure it out or we'll move to another country and do our business there. <laughs> Personally, that's that's how I feel this is really shaking out. It's not so much a Oh, you know the the government's going to make cryptocurrencies illegal, and so you know we're not really sure which way to go. And no, 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 no. 
but the RBI, um, I think they're just acting in their own their own self interest, and I, I think that's probably what it'll come down to. And, and they might try and sugarcoat it by saying it's something like, you know, oh, we we're not sure about the security of these markets, and we're we're afraid that it's going to expose our customers to undue risk. You know, that that's pers- perfectly reasonable from a business standpoint. And as far as I can see, that's that's probably the only justification that would actually justify their their actions. But I think in the longer term, they're they're going to find that that's not really an excuse. You know that the court will probably come back that saying something to the effect of these networks have been live for about a decade now, or at least one of them has. And from what we can tell or what I've observed, there there is no significant threat to your customers by allowing them to deposit rupees in your bank. <laughs> if anything, that gives them an anchor point, you know, to operate from, you know, whether it be their the base for their business or the the rupee interface for their business. You're basically just cutting your cutting your nose off to save or spite your face here, you know. I mean, it, it's losing money that you could be earning. It's costing a lot of people money that they could be earning. And in the longer term, I I think the the one analyst is is really, um, I think he's a little bit off on costing costing India thirteen billion dollars. I think they would be losing a hell of a lot more money than that. You know, especially given the fact that they they have a a relatively tech centric economy. I mean, they've got the, they're a little bit ahead of us with regard to the depth of their economy that re- revolves around internet activity and business. And so, for them, I think that cryptocurrencies are a shoo in, and they really have to start analyzing the the effect that the U.S. dollar has on the the relative value of their currencies as their currency rather as well as the products that they import and export and really taking a look at whether or not cryptocurrencies could be advantaging them by giving them better rates it's definitely something for governments to consider and i think that in the longer term governments are going to get realistic about it and say to themselves hey you know if we clamp down on this, this is actually going to be worse for us because the shit's not going to happen here. The better shit is going to happen elsewhere. And despite the fact that shit is global, we really want as much of it happening in our economy within our geographic area that we, you know, we tax the people that are involved and whatnot. We want it to happen here as opposed to Bangladesh or Hong Kong or Estonia or the Bahamas or the Isle of Man, or Zug, Switzerland. Some place that really doesn't give a fuck what other people are doing with their money. You know, we need that to be happening here instead. Anyway, it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. Uh, we will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole, because nobody else is going to do it for you. And as far as our last dance is concerned, I'm looking for it right now. And I think I think we can probably fit that one in. Yeah, let's do it. Prong. We have not played any prong this evening. It's a shame. We're going to play it right now. Revenge. Best served cold. Last dance. Here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening. And you all have an excellent evening. Good night.